Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the online seminar series of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences. In order to mitigate the demoralization effects associated with COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak, which unfortunately continues to evolve in the world, we organize inspiring online seminar series for national and international audiences in various branches of fundamental sciences, as well as in interdisciplinary areas. Today, we have a very special speaker, internationally well-known expert in the field, Dr. Luca Grinielli from Fritz Haber Institute of Max Planck Society in Germany. He's going to talk about artificial intelligence for data-driven material science, small data and interpretability. The talk is part of our interdisciplinary seminar series. At the end of the talk, we will have a section for questions, which can be asked by sending a message through chat button or just, or just raising hand. Luca Grignelli graduated from the Polytechnic University of Milan and received Italian laurea in nuclear engineering, specializing in material science. Then in 2006, he received his PhD at the University of Amsterdam. Later on, his life world line passed through different grants, such as Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship, European Commission NOMAD Novel Material Discovery Center for Excellence Grant. And finally, he became a group leader at the Fritz Haber Institute of Max Planck Society. Luca, thank you for accepting once again our invitation and joining us. With all this, I want to hand over the word to you to begin your talk, please. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. I hope I can be inspiring. <laughs> it's uh, quite of a challenge. And um, uh, so I think uh, I will start by sharing my screen. And then I think you can see now my, my slide, my initial slide, right? Okay, so the, um, the, the, the seminar uh, series is uh, interdisciplinary. So just to, to, to frame a little bit where I am, this is uh, about material science. Uh, so uh, predicting uh, material properties uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I start with a little bit of introduction on the, on the terminology. So there is this, uh, uh, big uh, hype about big data driven science and um, and um, this 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 terminology was introduced uh, 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 quite some time ago in 2007 probably was the first time uh, uh, Jean Grey uh, realized uh, that we are probably facing uh, uh, what he called the fourth paradigm in, uh, in science uh, where the first paradigm would be uh, empirical science prior to the um, introduction of the scientific method in the early uh, 17th century. Uh, and then probably many people would agree that uh, another paradigm uh, arose when, uh, uh, when uh, computer uh, were uh, used to, to, to make prediction in, in science, in physics at the beginning, and then overall in different fields of science. Um, and probably nowadays, uh, with the introduction of uh, big data analytics, uh, uh, we are facing uh, a yet new uh, paradigm. Um, some people could be uh, curious on what is big in the, in the, in the data. So uh, experts uh, say that there are four uh, the different characteristics for, for the data to be big. So the, 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 the kind of uh, easy one is, is volume. So when one here big, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that there are a lot of data. 
but that's not uh, the only parameter. It could be also the velocity at which the rate, the data are, are transmitted and, uh, and, and stored and retrieved. So that's an issue also to, to, that makes them big. Um, what is more interesting, uh, at least in my field, is the variety of these data. So uh, that is a, a, a way to say that there is a certain complexity in the data. Uh, we do calculations uh, of different properties with uh, complicated workflows. And we want to uh, have the data um, um, achievable and, and, and can be reached and, and used uh, uh, to make some, uh, some kind of good analysis. And we have the, the issues of veracity so that the data that are used to do the analysis are actually trustful uh, at several levels. Um, I stay a little bit uh, with the with terminology. Uh, in order to kind of frame a little bit where I am. And um, so uh, we have the, the big field of, uh, of artificial intelligence uh, that is a kind of old dis discipline. It started uh, in, the, in the half of the last century with algorithms that try to mimic the human intelligence. Uh, so uh, initially it was like uh, decision trees, uh, if then rules. And then later, uh, uh, machine learning started and, 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 and also compressed sensing. This is one thing I will talk about later. Uh, so a subset of artificial intelligence is, is machine learning. And the important thing to uh, understand in, in machine learning is that uh, the learning uh, stays for the fact that uh, uh, the algorithms uh, improve uh, by construction with more data. Uh, and a subset of all this is deep learning that uh, actually will not really touch today. Um, so deep neural networks uh, and so on are a subset of, uh, of machine learning. Now, uh, le let me start a bit uh, uh, provocative, uh, saying that uh, uh, it's not that new that, that, that science is data driven, right? So there is this big data in front of data driven, but you also have seen in my title that I, I say small data. So let, let, let me come to this a little bit in, in steps. Um, so imagine uh, uh, like as a kind of thought experiment that, that uh, you know, uh, in some way trajectories of planets in the solar system. I'm just going historical a little bit to introduce why I think that, that uh, uh, we are not doing anything much new with, with the, the data driven uh, science. Um, and, uh, and this could come from accurate observations or because you have uh, numerically solved some uh, general relativity equations. And then you fiddle with the data. Uh, and if you are uh, a genius like Kepler, you understand that there is an, an extremely nice regularity between uh, uh, the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbits uh, and, and the square of the orbital period of the planets. And mind that uh, Kepler had data only until Saturn. So six data points, straight line. And uh, this is one of uh, the three laws of Kepler. And so this is uh, purely data driven, right? And then uh, after some decades, uh, uh, Isaac Newton came with a law that uh, explains why this, this empirical observation uh, is true. Now, mind that. Uh, oops, this should not happen. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, the also Newton's law is uh, is uh, is empirical, right? So it's it's simpler because you can derive the the Kepler's law, but it's also empirical. It doesn't explain why uh, gravity is works like uh, Newton wrote it down. It's just a simpler law than than the than Kepler's law. Um, Closer to material science uh, is uh, another uh, very uh, uh, dear example that is the periodic table uh, of the elements. And this is the uh, second version by Mendeleev, Mendeleev himself, in which, uh, um, so Mendeleev understood that if you uh, table the data, uh, 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 so the, the, the known chemical elements by uh, the way they would react with oxygen and hydrogen, so the stoichiometry of the reaction of the stable molecule forming, and then ordering them by um, atomic uh, um, weight. Of course, they didn't know anything about atomic number uh, at that time. 
he realized that there is some periodicity, right? So this thing uh, repeats uh, over and over uh, a few times. Uh, and the amazing thing is that uh, Mendeleev could predict that there were missing uh, uh, elements. So these two missing spots were predicted by Mendeleev and later on were identified, say, as Gallium uh, and Germanium. So what we would like to do uh, these days is uh, to, uh, uh, well, the, the, the periodic table of element is, uh, is known, uh, uh, but, but what we have, uh, we don't have a, a, a good a simple way to, to, to navigate is the periodic table or charts of, uh, of materials properties. So um, uh, the motivation of my work is, is uh, in, in my group is to try and understand um, if we can produce uh, maps, charts of, uh, of uh, materials properties uh, by uh, looking into the data in the, in, in the most unbiased possible way. So a little bit of a roadmap for, for today's talk is uh, that I will show something about learning uh, predictive uh, and interpretable maps of material properties uh, with a focus on the fact that we can use small data to make this uh, uh, prediction and interpretation. Uh, and then uh, something uh, a bit uh, more advanced uh, in which we do diagnostic on, uh, on learned models by using another artificial intelligence technique. So artificial intelligence on top of artificial intelligence in order to understanding what we are doing. And then I will have a, a final comment on reproducibility and, and the so-called fair practices for data handling. So let me start with the learning predictive interpretable maps. And the general idea of these maps is uh, as simple as this. So what I have in, in mind is really having some kind of uh, uh, um, cartographic map, like uh, uh, nations or territories on a, on, a, on, a, on a cartographic map, which materials lay down such that materials with similar properties uh, are, are all together in the same, the same nation. So this would be an example I will come back later uh, about uh, octet binaries. So some, some, some binary materials that would crystallize either as rock salt or zinc blend. Uh, and then some examples that I will actually not really touch later, but just to have a kind of a cartoon. Um, so some, some materials could be metals or insulators. Uh, some could be the, um, topological insulators uh, versus trivial insulators. And as you see, uh, the, the common denominator of these of these plots is that it's a, it's a two-dimensional plot, and and just to be clear, it's two-dimensional because it's nice to put on a slide a two-dimensional plot, but it could be a higher-dimensional map. What I uh, am doing uh, will show how to, to derive, um, and and uh, and there is this uh, mysterious d1, d2 on the axis, prime, second prime, and so on. Um, and the idea is that we would like to find this descriptor so that we have that, that, that this axis uh, have some, uh, some uh, coordinates and we can label the coordinates and we call these descriptors and we can look into these descriptors. Uh, another example of, uh, of a map. And this is uh, uh, say uh, uh, the, the first board in, 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 in our lab. Uh, the first map of octet binaries that was actually produced with the methodology that I'm going to explain you in the next slide. So this is just to show that uh, where we are going to. Um, so a little bit of uh, mathematics now. Uh, uh, the technology that uh, I'm using uh, is a combination of um, uh, uh, compressed sensing and symbolic regression. Let me go uh, to explain what this means uh, step by step. So. Um, let me start with uh, 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 some property, so a scalar property of a material, say some formation energy, some band gap or something like that. And uh, uh, as typical in physics, I start by expanding the property over a basis set, right? This you can always do. If you have a good basis set, this may work. So how do I construct a good basis set? Well, this is the part that, that I don't know. So let me be completely uh, wild about the uh, creation of the, the basis set. I start from some ingredients. Uh, later we show some electron affinity and initial potentials of uh, the atoms that constitute the material. And then I, I write, uh, uh, I construct nonlinear functions of these features. And I construct a lot of them. Each of these function is a basis function. 
And now the, uh, my requirement is that I would like to express uh, my property as a linear combination of as few as possible of these basis functions. Where the catch is that I identify which basis functions matter the most. In mathematical terms, this uh, uh, requires to minimize the uh, say prediction error. So I, I write my property as a linear combination between my uh, descriptor matrix, the column of this matrix are this D1, D2, and Dn, uh, times some coefficient. But then I say that the number of coefficients that are different from zero, that mathematically is, is, is written by this uh, norm zero, um, is as small as possible. So I pay a penalty every time a coefficient is different from zero. If I put together this thing and I try to minimize, what I find is a solution to this system such that the number of non-zero coefficient in this expansion is as small as possible. So at the same time, I find some basis function that matter the most. And uh, I also find a good prediction of my property. This is essentially what I need to construct my maps. So how do, how do I construct these uh, uh, basis functions? I start from this property and just combine them with some uh, uh, elementary uh, operators like sums, um, absolute module of the difference, say exponentials, powers. And then I construct a tree like this one. This means that I do uh, this difference divided by this sum here. And this gives me the possibility to, to uh, uh, construct expressions like this. And I construct a lot of them. Now it's time to say what I mean by a lot. A lot means that at the moment we can treat uh, billions uh, or, or even several billions or, 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 or 10 to the power 10 or 11 of these, uh, of these properties. Um, and, the, and the nice thing of this uh, uh, technology that, use, that is called compressed sensing is that I can have uh, 10 to the 9, 10, or something of these uh, uh, columns in my uh, matrix, but only few uh, uh, rows, say 100, 500, something like that. Uh, and under the constraint that I find a solution with only few coefficients that are different from zero, I still find a stable solution. This sounds like magic, but it can work. So the way we find the solution, I have only one slide on the actual methodology that we introduced in my group, it's called CISO, thanks to the work uh, mainly of uh, Run Hai or Yang, that was a postdoc with me and now a professor in, in Shanghai. And, uh, and uh, so the way we solved this, this uh, uh, equation is uh, by iterative uh, uh, construction, by, by projecting uh, the, the, this, this uh, uh, candidate uh, basis function that we have here onto the property. This gives us uh, uh, some, some residual. And then we find uh, features that uh, project uh, maximally onto the residual. The catch is that we find uh, a subset of properties that project maximally on the property and a subset that project maximally on the residual. And then we uh, uh, enumerate all possible uh, uh, solutions inside this subset of, of properties. So we go from 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, to say a thousand or, or less, and then we find the optimal solution uh, among these uh, few uh, selected features. And this is again, this, this kind of uh, uh, first solution that we have, and we have the octet binaries. So this material crystallizes either as rock salt or zinc blend. On, on this side here, you have a carbon diamond, and, and you have to read this uh, diagram in this way. The farther you are from, from this uh, uh, green line, that is where the two materials, uh, uh, where, where the, the two phases, Roxos and Zinkblad, coexist, the farther you are from this line, uh, the more stable you are as a zinc blend uh, on this direction and as rock salt on this direction. So here you have the rock salt materials and you have the zinc blend and the carbon diamond is the strongest uh, zinc blend and other known like uh, boron nitride and borophosphide that are very strong zinc blend material with respect to the rock salt phases. And, and here what, what we mean by interpretable, we have simple expression on the axis as simple as they get by the minimization pr pr procedure and we can relate, uh, uh, so the leading factor here, for example, is, uh, is uh, this difference between a social potential electron affinity that is related to the bank, uh, to, 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 to the homoluma gap in the, in the atom, that the D is always the um, uh, cation in, uh, sorry, the anion in our, 
in our uh, AB octet binary, and then some other properties. Um, I will have more examples on this, so okay, I will not spend uh, much time on this. That is a kind of trivial example to some extent. Um, what I, I would like to show is that uh, uh, the methodology that we introduced uh, tells how complex should be the formula. By complex, we mean at the same time, how many uh, um, um, dimension the, the map should have in order to give a good prediction, but also how complicated really should the expression on the axis be. And this is done by the so-called cross validation. Now I don't go into detail. The idea is to, uh, uh, to um, train different models by, by changing uh, the, the, the data that are used for training and then test them on, uh, on data that were not used for training. And what we find is this. See one part of the plot. Um, this, these two lines are two different complexity of my uh, formula. So let's say the green line is a formula medium complex, and the, and the, and the orange line is a more complex formulas. And we see that from green to, uh, to orange, we improve just a little bit the, the prediction error. What is clear is that we need three dimensions to, to minimize our error. And this would be the optimal dimension of our, uh, of our map. So uh, as, as a summary of what this uh, introduced compressed sensing with the um, uh, symbolic regression methodology that we have introduced, uh, so to, 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 to frame it a little bit in a, in a wider context, um, uh, uh, we can say uh, what we are doing is a regularized regression. So we are doing regression. Uh, that is essentially in this formula. The regularization is the fact that the number of non-zero coefficients in the expansion is as small as possible. So this is this so-called uh, massive, massive specification. It's a dimensionality reduction. So we start from a huge number of dimensions and we single out the dimensions that matter the most. So this uh, is, is, a, is a much wider field, the, 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 the field of dimension reduction. And the, the, the catch here is that we have supervised uh, uh, a dimensionality reduction typically is unsupervised. I, I don't explain too much now what this means. If you want to know, just ask me later. Uh, and also we have descriptors on the axis. So the dimension that we extract can be read okay, uh, while, uh, so inspected, while, while typically in dimension reduction, uh, uh, this is not possible. Um, so it is also uh, a, a, a feature uh, selection or extraction with something that is a non-greedy solver. So I, let me just claim this. If you want to know more, I can, I can specify. And we are doing a symbolic regression with a deterministic solver because uh, I specify this because uh, uh, almost all symbolic regression uh, prior to our introduction of the method um, uh, was, was uh, using a genetic algorithm, so a stochastic solver. Now, uh, symbolic regression is, is living a kind of renaissance. If you go to archive, you will find a lot of papers doing symbolic regression with neural networks. We don't use neural networks, we use this compressed sensing. And uh, so we will see uh, where the future uh, goes. Um, okay, one thing I didn't mention, is that uh, the method, the algorithm, the solution algorithm by construction is massively parallel also. So it could be quite demanding to run on a laptop, but it's perfectly scalable uh, on, on, on supercomputers. So this is a, a very nice uh, property of this uh, uh, kind of uh, algorithm. Okay, now let me go a bit uh, further and I would like to introduce uh, what we call uh, multitask learning. So we would like to find uh, at the same time descriptors, so our axes on, 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 the, on the map that are good for several property at the same time um, uh, uh, in order to have uh, only one map for different properties. Why this could be interesting? Okay, let, let me uh, show it a bit the position of the problem. So we have several properties, property one uh, up to mt. And then we are looking for, again, this uh, uh, linear uh, construction uh, where the property K is uh, descriptor times uh, uh, some coefficient CK. But there is no K in the descriptor. This is because there is only one descriptor for all the properties. Now, what I explained before is could be called single task CISO. Uh, the idea is to um, uh, extract columns in our uh, matrix uh, capital D 
and, and, and these are uh, extracted by the coefficients that are different from zero in our uh, linear system, right? Now, what we do is we have a lot of uh, systems, one for each property, P1, P2, Pm, and, and we want to uh, select the same columns, right? We want to have the same descriptor. Uh, the training coefficients could be uh, uh, different. Uh, there is a rest end. I don't know if I should try to uh, reply now or we keep all the questions to the end. I, I'm not so sure. Uh, Alikram? Yes. There is a raised hand. I don't know if uh, this should be addressed now or. Uh, let us please should... at the end of the talk. Okay, so I, let, let's have it at the end. Okay, so I was saying uh, we have different properties and, and, and we want to single out the same description. And this is shown graphically here. And, and the, the gray uh, uh, rows here indicates a very interesting uh, feature of this uh, uh, position of the problem that is, we don't need to have uh, the property for all the, the, the points in the data set, for all the material in our case in the data set. So you may know the property for some, so those that are colored here in, 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 in some color that is not gray, but for some other materials, you don't know the property. Still, you could find a good descriptor that, that predicts everything at the same time. So it's a good strategy also to fill the gaps in incomplete databases, they say. Um, where do we, did we apply this thing? Well, uh, we, we implemented this because we were after uh, uh, phase diagrams where we have uh, more than two phases in the same diagram. And we wanted to have the same uh, axis on the diagram. So uh, let's say that instead of roxel zimblen we also now have uh, uh, only roxel zimblen now we have roxel zimblen and uh, say the cesium chloride phase. And we can build a, a phase diagram with three phases. Actually, we went up to five phases for these dotted binaries. So this is the general formula now for, for uh, the solution. Oh, let me skip this one. Uh, let's go to our solution. And, and we have uh, a phase diagram for octet binaries where we have uh, uh, now three areas, also a small area for cesium chloride. Uh, and and the, the solution gives us much more than just the uh, uh, area in which uh, each material is, is more stable. We can go through a cut here. So that is uh, represented here, where we have uh, uh, basically what would be here, the axis, the vertical axis uh, uh, popping out of the screen. Um, and, and we have the different phases. So if we walk along this line, we would go from uh, the cesium chloride to the rock salt to the zinc blend. But we also notice that the nickel arsenide phase is not far away from, from uh, um, say the, the, the rock salt in this area here. So we may want to check if also the, the nickel arsenide phase could be possible. Okay, so also here uh, we have that this methodology use small data. When I say small data, I want really to, to underline that we use uh, uh, say hundred, maybe few hundreds data points, while the typical machine learning efforts, uh, they typically use thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands if you go to deep learning. So uh, we make the best use of, uh, of the data with the somewhat simple model. Now I show two kind of uh, cutting edge applications uh, uh, that use actually a variant of, of our methodology that is called, uh, this is the classification part of, uh, of CISO. Until now I, I, I was talking about regression, so a, a continuous property. Now we look at, into, into classification. Uh, and the, the position is very similar. We just have to find a slightly different uh, um, um, cost function. Um, so we, we are after constructing maps in which points belonging to different properties land in different uh, territories, and there is no overlap. And this is what we impose uh, to our uh, uh, minimization here. Uh, so the application, uh, the, one of the most notable, or probably so far the most notable, is the uh, improvement of the so-called Goldschmidt tolerance factor uh, for predicting, predicting perovskite uh, stability. So this is the slide that you have seen in the, in the poster announcing this, this talk. And what we wanted to do is to see if we could uh, do better than this empirical formula found by, by Goldschmidt with, uh, essentially 100 years ago uh, in, in basically Kepler's style. So he put together data, he had some idea, and, and then he found this, this uh, good formula that uh, predicts to some extent 
uh, whether materials uh, uh, would crystallize at perovskites or not, materials with this uh, uh, chemical composition. Um, so this is uh, the Goldschmidt uh, uh, accuracy, uh, Goldschmidt uh, tolerance factor accuracy. Uh, if, if this T is between these two values, uh, 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 Goldschmidt says uh, you, you form a perovskite. The accuracy of this is not bad, but can be improved. So we ran our machinery and we found a slightly more complex uh, uh, formula, but using exactly the same ingredients. So the so-called Shannon radii of, uh, of uh, the atoms. And we have the oxidation state that looks like an extra information, but actually is, is, is used also for determining the Shannon radii. So if you want to know more, I can, I can be more specific. But the catch is that we have this equation that is slightly more complex than, than, than uh, Goldschmidt. And, um, and uh, has a, 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 higher predict, a higher accuracy if we just split uh, 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 with a kind of a, a sharp uh, a step at this uh, uh, value here. But if we allow a little bit of leeway and we say, well, we say that stable perovskites are, are here and, and clearly non-stable perovskites are here, the accuracy goes up. Uh, this is not just trying to, to dress a little bit better what we have, uh, we have an extra property here. We have a one dimensional map and, and we have a continuous monotonic uh, uh, probability uh, increasing from, uh, uh, actually decreasing from 100% probability to be stable perovskite to zero probability to be stable perovskite continuously in this range. So uh, we can construct uh, materials maps like this one. So let's say that we uh, fix uh, what is the uh, atom X here to oxygen, and we fix also the oxidation number of the uh, big uh, anion, uh, cation. And we explore uh, the space of uh, radii for uh, uh, the two cations. And, uh, and we see that we have probability to form a, a pair of sky stable. So zero is, is low and blue is high. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the plotted data points are those that are confirmed from experiment. Not only, we can go a step forward and say, uh, we have double perovskites in which we have two different uh, uh, cations in the B uh, uh, position, so called B and B prime. And if we use as, as radius in this formula, the average of the two radii of the two expression of the two materials, we find a, a, a map for uh, um, uh, double perovskites. Uh, actually, these are two different uh, with, uh, with, uh, with cesium or lanthanum. And, uh, and we confirm what is known experimentally, but we, we predict uh, 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 thousands unknown uh, um, double perovskite that are stable. And the next example actually predict millions of new materials. This is uh, the case of tetrabamite. And it's, it's a material with this uh, general formula, AB LNM, where AB could be these three elements and LNM could be these three elements. They form these uh, uh, stacked uh, uh, layer structures. Um, and, uh, and we were trying to see if we can predict uh, whether these are topological insulator or trivial insulator by just looking at uh, one of these units and then doing kind of a mixture model to uh, model the, the layering. So uh, the, the CISO learning identified a, a very good descriptor to split uh, perfectly between topological insulator and trivial insulators uh, once given the formula. So once you know A, B, and L and N, uh, you have this descriptor uh, on the two axes uh, that uh, predicts exactly whether if you uh, will form a trivial or topological insulator. Uh, and, and the input information is just the atomic number here, Z, A, B, and so on, and the electronegativity chi for M and N. So this formula is, is you see, is, is quite nice and symmetric, A, B, and then L, M, and then you have this difference with the, again, A, B, and L, M, so it doesn't depend on, uh, uh, for example, the N. Um, and this comes out from the, from the algorithm. We didn't impose any symmetry. So uh, this, this descriptor was selected and it proved to be a, a, a very good one. Then we exploit this, uh, this model by just saying, okay, now let's, let's construct layer materials 
uh, by just having uh, some kind of uh, uh, fractional uh, occupation of the of the sites, and we can product uh, uh, kind of scan the whole material space that has uh, uh, millions of possibilities. Well, actually infinite, but we, we coarse grained uh, or we discretized x and y, a and b to some uh, uh, fixed points in order to have the supercells of uh, finite size, and. Uh, um, and, and these are the points that were actually tried with DFT calculations, and, and they were always predicted correctly by our model. So now the challenge is up for the experimentalists to produce this material and see if uh, indeed you can have all these new topological insulators out there. Okay, let me switch a bit gears now, and I go to uh, uh, a bit uh, more uh, uh, advanced uh, method in terms of uh, uh, concept that are introduced. And, and uh, 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 what I'm introducing now is subgroup discovery and I will tell uh, in a few slides uh, where we apply it. So in order to understand what's going on, uh, consider uh, that you have uh, some kind of, uh, uh, some data points here. Uh, we don't deal with so few data points, it's just a cartoon. And imagine that you uh, plot uh, these data points uh, 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 as a property one versus property two, anything you like. And you see, uh, and you try to make a, a linear regression among these data points and you see this kind of trend. But you also notice in this very simple case that if you uh, split into uh, subgroups, uh, the data points, uh, and you now do the, the, the linear fit, um, not only you have a better agreement with the data points, uh, but uh, uh, the, the trend of the local model is completely different from the, uh, what happens uh, to the global model. Now, again, think that this is just a cartoon. We are, one would not uh, sponsor to do the linear fit with three data points and say this is better than with six. Um, let's go to a slightly more elaborate example. And let's say that we have so many data points. Uh, and so we have a population and we have some target property P and we have some features uh, here. So this is only one. And you try to make some kind of a good fit of this data and this is the best maybe one can do with this cloud of points. And you say, well, maybe I'm not satisfied. You may notice that uh, if you focus in this area of the descriptor, um, you have a much better uh, uh, fit, uh, uh, especially if you do an horizontal line here. Uh, so if the value of the descriptor is smaller than the 0 0.2, you would have a much better prediction for these data points than for the whole model. Um, further, you may also use another feature that uh, here is, is uh, uh, kind of symbolized by, by two different symbols on the, on the, on the plot, squares and, and, and circles. And then you may notice that if you focus on the circles and you uh, have that the value of the, the, the feature D1 is bigger than a certain threshold, um, you have also a, a good fit with an horizontal line. So now imagine that you have uh, tens, hundreds of these uh, of these features and you want to search all the combinations of these features in order to find subset that have a simpler model than the global model or some outstanding uh, uh, um, uh, characteristic of, uh, of uh, the, the properties of, uh, of the data points with respect to the, to the other models. Of course, you would not like to do that manually by browsing uh, uh, all the, 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 the pairs or the triplets and so on. You want to have a, an automatic method to do that. And this is what we are uh, doing now with subgroup discovery. I will not go at all into the, the way the, the, the method works. I want just, the method just finds these uh, special subgroups um, automatically by just defining how they should look like in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, some abstract uh, properties that the uh, researcher designs. So let me be specific. Uh, and this is the uh, recent paper that is uh, still in press, uh, but you can still, uh, you can already find it in, uh, in, in Chem Archive. Uh, and so what we are, we are after here, uh, the target property was uh, uh, predicted absolute errors of, of some machine learning models. So that's why at the beginning I said we are a, a, a level of abstraction higher. So we have some machine learning model and we would like to understand not 
match uh, how good they are globally. That is the typical analysis that uh, people do in order to compare machine learning models. But where the model perform better or worse in the uh, data space. So in our case, it's always the material space. So that means that, that some of the machine learning models could perform better for some materials and other could perform better for some other material. Imagine that you can know beforehand which model before, perform better for which one. So you could kind of select which model. Or if you know that your model is not performing better for some materials, you may zoom in and check why this happens and try to improve your model. Okay, so what we do is try to find the subgroups of, of our data points that first of all are not that small. So this is a, a condition that we always ask to our subgroups because otherwise you always end up to one point per subgroup. Um, and then we also want that the difference between the, the, this uh, absolute error, actually you use the relative absolute error for, for a technical reason, uh, uh, between the, the whole population and the subgroup, uh, this, this difference is maximized. So what we have is that we have a training set, we have machine learning model, and then we identify what we call the domain of applicability. So where our model has particularly small prediction error. So this is just again a cartoon in which there is a small area in which our very simple model in this case is, is, is performing particularly well. And you want to identify these regions without uh, calculating the, 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 the model uh, uh, itself. So you just look at, the, at the, uh, some features of the material and you say, this model will perform better here. What we used here was uh, the data that were used uh, a couple of years ago for the so-called Kaggle competition. That was a, a, a hugely successful uh, competition uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, machine learning for material science where uh, uh, almost 1000 uh, groups uh, competed uh, to, to make the best model for uh, this, this kind of materials for which we get a few thousand data points and they, are, uh, they work. Uh, so the, 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 the idea was that you can decorate uh, uh, supercells in different way with this uh, aluminum, gallium and indium. And, and you have different uh, formation energies, band gaps, and so on. Uh, so when we applied this uh, um, uh, diagnostic, so this subgroup discovery diagnostic to different models uh, that were uh, uh, identified with uh, um, models that, that are among the best, uh, those that, uh, so that won the, the competition actually, we found that, uh, uh, so we, we gave some, some uh, uh, features to, 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 to uh, browse, to, to, to the subgroup discovery, uh, that importantly are common to uh, uh, all model in the sense that this is a way to represent the materials that is uh, independent of the way the particular machine learning is, is, uh, is, the, is representing the materials in order to, 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 to train uh, their own model. Uh, so, uh, the result is that in particular for this uh, so-called uh, many body tensor representation, I will not go into detail, uh, we have a, a, a remarkable reduction of error in a subset of, uh, of materials um, uh, that are identified by these uh, kind of macroscopic uh, features. So whenever you get a data point, you know whether you belong or not to this class. So you know whether you will get a small error or not. So this is a kind of new way to analyze uh, machine learning models and trying to, to get the best uh, out of them and also to understand what's going on. For example, you see that all the models seem to uh, prefer small uh, gamma angles. So this is uh, uh, in the supercell, one of the angles. So apparently uh, when this angle is actually wide, all the models have much more problems. So one might want to investigate what happens there. And this is a kind of spotlight that tells you, well, okay, there is a problem there probably. Uh, maybe you, you have to improve your uh, descriptor for your model uh, when, when these angles become, uh, become large. Okay, now a few words on, uh, on uh, reproducibility. Uh, so we have been talking, I have been talking uh, about data science and, and uh, I, I, I hope everybody agrees that is a, a, a big uh, um, uh, resource for the future. The data are a big resource and, uh, and, but we have to use them in, uh, uh, in the proper way. Use them in the proper way means that we also have to store them in the proper way and index them in the proper way. 
and, uh, and, and this is uh, related mainly to the idea of reproducibility, so that we store the data in, in such a way that uh, we can find them again and reproduce what was done uh, uh, years before, months before, and probably and, 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 and try to do something better. So in 2016, uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, big group of people uh, uh, published this uh, fair guiding principles for data management and stewardship. So uh, very nice uh, acronym FAIR stands for Fendable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable, also Recyclable and uh, Purposeful, um, where the idea is really that, uh, that one has to uh, attach metadata to the data in order to know exactly how they were produced and they can be reused they can be used in other contexts, interoperability, and they can be used to do, uh, say, other machine learning uh, uh, analysis. So as, as uh, in many cases in, in, in science, good ideas uh, are around for a while. So even though the paper that, that framed the principle was 2016, the Novel Materials Discovery Center of Excellence uh, has had a, a fair storage since 2014. We didn't call it fair. Uh, so the novel material discovery is a, is a center of excellence uh, um, uh, whose uh, uh, um, coordinator is Matthias Schaeffer, so and and it's a consortium of uh, uh, many different uh, research groups uh, in uh, in Germany, uh, Europe, uh, and UK, um, and and uh, HPC centers uh, also all around Europe. Uh, so the, the, the current status of, of this uh, NOMAD uh, uh, laboratory, uh, the way we call it, is uh, uh, based on what we call the repository uh, that has, uh, it is a collection of input and outputs from atomistic simulation codes as they come out from the calculation. Uh, then we have a, a processing uh, uh, of the data in order to store uh, the data in what we call the archive uh, uh, where the, 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 the data are represented in a code independent way that uh, uh, more and more will be artificial intelligence uh, ready. Um, so this uh, allows uh, to do the, the uh, uh, inspection of the data. So you could see any published uh, uh, work uh, that has uploaded the data on the repository and then in the archive, you can inspect what are the data, what was used for the calculation and so on. But you could also reproduce the uh, analysis that, that was done uh, after uh, uh, the, the production of the data. In particular, uh, we have uh, uh, what we call the artificial intelligence toolkit that is a, a web-based uh, infrastructure based on Python notebook uh, where people can uh, run uh, uh, pre-existing notebooks uh, that have some artificial intelligence uh, analysis in it and also uh, produce new notebooks. Uh, and the idea here is to have uh, uh, tutorials on uh, some textbook, uh, but also some uh, newly introduced artificial intelligence methods. Um, and uh, this is where reproducibility comes, but one can, and, and we are trying to do uh, as much as possible, upload uh, notebooks that, that go through some artificial intelligence uh, uh, training and, and exploitation that was done for some publication. So you can check all, uh, all the steps uh, because when you, when you do some machine learning, you have so many parameters that uh, yes, you tell in the paper, but sometimes you forget to say something, a referee doesn't notice. Well, here you can put your hand on exactly the algorithm that we use, which parameters were used to obtain exactly the results. So if you go to this uh, uh, link here, you will find some examples um, of, of these uh, uh, notebooks, uh, and we invite the community to upload their uh, uh, own notebooks. <coughs> okay, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, there is a, a very long list of people uh, to present all this outstanding work that, that I present here. Uh, and I want to uh, recap by saying that I presented uh, why artificial intelligence and machine learning can, as is useful for science, material science in particular, beyond just fitting numbers. So uh, we can have these interpretable maps of material properties using not so uh, many data, um, and also have this diagnostic uh, of learned models uh, as I shown with the subtle discovery. So I thank you for your attention and I stand here for, for questions.
probably hello so alikram are there some questions i don't know where to look maybe should stop sharing There were some raised ends. Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for the very inspiring and absolutely amazing talk. Uh, I truly enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the extent to which you think uh, we can go ahead with the current uh, computational power which is available. I mean, is it possible to maybe potentially map all of the possibilities uh, that material can possibly uh, possess with similar methods that you have mentioned? Or maybe if not today, how much uh, further does the computational power uh, should be extended until we can actually get a good grasp of the uh, entire world of possibilities which the amazing material can have? Thank you once again. Thank you. Let, 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 let me see if I understand the question. So uh, certainly you may want to address different properties um, of, uh, of materials at the same time, because typically, uh, say, if you want a good, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, material for photovoltaic, you want some, some optical properties, maybe some electrical conductivity properties, but also you want that the material, say, it does not contain radioactive elements or, or something like this. So you may have a cascade of requests and you may want to uh, uh, find a material that satisfies all the property at the same time. So this is one order of complexity. Uh, but I'm not so sure one would like to find uh, a kind of, uh, yeah, at the beginning I started with the periodic table, but something that encompasses all possible properties for all possible materials. I'm not so sure this is uh, the target. Probably you would like to frame, uh, 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 let's say, a, a, a task. So you want a material for something that has a list of properties, and then you want to single out which one is the best. So I see that the computational complexity is more in the way you represent the material. In my case, I have this, uh, a huge uh, a set of possibilities, uh, these this features, these basis functions. And this is where uh, uh, the, the, the computer time is spent because it has to deal with the uh, uh, large matrices and, and find the best solution. But having three, four, five, maybe even 10 properties, well, it's case essentially linearly with the properties because you are not combinatorially ch searching all the possible properties. You're just finding something that is, is predicting well the different properties. So the, the computational explosion is in the complexity of the model. In my case, the number of features. In other cases, uh, could be some, some, some other property of, of, of the artificial intelligence model. Um, and also imagine that most likely you will not ever be searching over all possible materials that probably is infinite. Uh, you are uh, kind of focusing on, on some region of the material space. So I don't see much uh, a, a problem of complexity and therefore computational complexity arising from, uh, from this part of analysis. It could more be a problem of having the good training data. So you would need to have the good uh, experiment, uh, the good uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, material science uh, model um, methods to find a good reference. This is where the complexity can scale up quite a lot. I don't know if uh, this answered a bit uh, uh, Mubashir's uh, question. Still, it has to be remember that, that this artificial intelligence can be quite intensive. So nowadays we talk about exascale and uh, uh, we, we can <laughs> sort of exascale with, with artificial intelligence training and exploitation, but typically not but, but uh, let's say, and these are typically uh, uh, massively parallel models. So they, they scale up quite nicely. 
Any other questions? Can I, can I ask? Please, go ahead. Uh, primarily, uh, thank you so much for presentation. Um, I learned AI, uh, chemical molecules, atoms, relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, can I find a new, a new element for use the molecules, atoms, elements for uh, this you mean, method. You, you mean the new chemical element? Yeah. Well, okay, so let me put it this way. From, so, so the chemical elements uh, cannot have uh, uh, say uh, uh, fractional atomic number, right? So from one, from hydrogen until I don't know exactly where we are now, but I say uh, Z equal 100 and something uh, we have filled in. I can imagine that uh, one can extrapolate atomic properties and say maybe there is an element with Z equal 150 <laughs> that fits best, but uh, this would be very daring. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, uh, until now I have not, I have not, uh, we have not thought about new chemical elements. What you typically, what we typically are after are, are a complex material, say with the, uh, uh, so it could be binary, ter say ternaries, quaternaries materials with large supercell or even uh, uh, materials with more components like the tetrabrimide that I've shown um, in which you have uh, uh, compositions. I, I mean, if you go to three, four, five uh, uh, different chemical species, the number of possible uh, stoichiometry is, is huge, almost infinite. So if you have a method that tells you look into this uh, area uh, of, of compositions and, and you will find a, a good material, this is uh, more the, the, the direction I, I think uh, the, this kind of methodologies can, can help us. So predicting uh, uh, um, unsuspected stoichiometries with known elements. I really never thought about uh, uh, new elements. Despite what uh, Iron Man has shown <laughs> in the <laughs> in the theaters, yeah. Just imagine when people discovered, um, uh, say, novel superconductors, they went to some kind of compositions uh, that nobody has, has uh, ever thought before. That was, again, sort of trial and error, guided intuition, guided uh, trial and error. And imagine that now you could do this more systematically because you, you, you can uh, computationally explore a huge compositional space uh, that would be impossible to do experimentally or with high level uh, ab initio methods uh, because it, it would be too expensive. So that's more or less uh, the... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, please? I see Sena Melis Kaleli in the in the chat. Yeah. Also for if I am not able to unmute myself. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for this great great presentation. Thank and uh, I just wanted to first uh, introduce myself. I'm a third grade student from Middle East Technical University and my mm -hmm. department is civil engineering. Although this is the fact, uh, I'm really curious about the world's greatest problems. And I think they all um, want 
um, a transdisciplinary approach rather than interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, what I focus on nowadays, I wanted to ask that, um, how can I, how we can use machine learning and uh, this uh, artificial intelligence on that kind of problems. For example, I, uh, I was just thinking on the problem of the waste management. Maybe we can have a, a system uh, or a new infrastructure um, on the, in the cities that we can maybe arrange the, um, this waste um, and classify them um, like the plastic and the glass or the other stuff because it's like um, the problem is that we can have we can have that um, kind of huge deposits on the streets or the on the, in the cities. That's why maybe we can have a one tank or deposit as uh, as like we have now, and then maybe with like using the fluid mechanics um, principles and the um, machine learning, maybe we can just then um, use this uh, whole stuff to maybe uh, classify them and then recycle them, whatever. But when I think about it, I, I, I'm not sure how we can do this uh, in terms of this new technology. Maybe um, like the problem, I just wanted to know how uh, can I do it? And first, firstly, how uh, can I, how can I pursue this in terms of like having knowledge on that, on it? Mm -hmm. The start point that I'm interested in. Okay, thanks for the question. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very general and broad. Um, let's say, um, from a very uh, kind of uh, um, distant perspective, machine learning or in general artificial intelligence is trying to find patterns in, in data, right? So uh, you, you typically, so you have to start with data for sure uh, that are uh, tabulated and indexed in some way. Um, and then you have, uh, let's say, typically some, some classification as you were uh, describing for, uh, for your waste management. And what machine learning does that typically the human cannot is to kind of uh, find uh, uh, representations such that one can predict say the classification of some target value uh, or even just notice that some data are similar, uh, data points are similar, uh, more similar among themselves than uh, others are among themselves and so on, or, or that uh, you don't need uh, so many parameters uh, to describe your uh, data points, but much fewer. So there are uh, uh, very different techniques in, in artificial intelligence and specifically in machine learning to address uh, uh, the problem. And typically you have first to uh, frame exactly what you want. So if you have some uh, uh, say uh, data points for which you know your classification. So if this is a uh, uh, wood or not for some uh, purpose or um, if, uh, if there is some property that is high or low and so on. Uh, probably you would use what is called supervised uh, learning. Uh, uh, that is a, a big class, but I presented today, but is, uh, is, much, uh, is much wider. If you want just to find which data look alike, use what's called uh, unsupervised learning um, and, uh, and, 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 and more. So you, uh, the starting point I think uh, is some good uh, in introductory course in, uh, in uh, say machine learning. So then let's, let's frame to machine learning instead of being a bit wider in, uh, in artificial intelligence. Um, in order to see a little bit what kind of different problems are addressed. And then you can think if, if what you have in mind can be framed in one of these, uh, in these, uh, in these classes. Um, so I don't know if your university has, has these uh, kind of courses, 
uh, my experience is that uh, online you can find uh, very good material. So I, I can be more specific now. I, I should I should go a little bit through my notes. Uh, if, if you want, just just email me and I can give you some more uh, information. Thank you. Any other questions, please? We can still take a couple of short questions, please. Yeah, Luca. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, we can stop here. And thank you very much, uh, you, for this very exciting talk. Thank you. I, uh, I, indeed, I want to also emphasize that Professor Luca Grinieli was one of the speakers at our this year summer school on machine learning and material science. But unfortunately, because of this coronavirus, we had to postpone this school for the next summer. So I strongly hope, believe that next summer we will come together at this school and then all our students and participants will have to ask face-to-face -face questions and discussions is very, very modern and exciting topics in interdisciplinary or uh, related area of modern uh, modern science or technology. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really count on uh, being able to come next summer. <laughs> Yeah, because I think I like the place, and because then it means uh, the uh, pandemic is is uh, yeah much less serious. And then uh, yeah, so if people want to um, get to me, they can find easily my email uh, uh, at the Fritz Haber and then just just uh, send me. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I, I think people can ask you through email some interested yeah. questions. Yeah. So in, indeed. Uh, our uh, students in, in Turkey a little bit shy always. They want uh, to ask questions, but uh, some sense uh, they are shy, but they I can mean, email yeah. you they can email you and ask these questions. R written is, uh, is, is easier. Yeah. yeah. So thanks a lot once again. Uh, see you Thank soon. You as soon as Corona settles uh, down away. Okay, mm. I'm looking forward. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.